But we were then fortunate enough to go to the American Embassy, where Jack Matlock at that time was the ambassador, and he started uh, unpacking for us what was going on uh, in the whirlwind which was, was surrounding <coughs> us. And he's been doing that ever since. Uh, after he uh, left the foreign, we retired from the foreign service basically when, when the Soviet Union ended uh, and has had a series of academic appointments at Columbia initially and then at Princeton in the Kennan Chair at the Center for Advanced Study. Uh, where he's produced a series of books on the post-Cold War world, on Russia and uh, related subjects. And he's here today giving the second of, of four lectures on uh, a forthcoming book from Yale Press called Distorting History, How Misunderstanding the Cold War Has Undermined America's Leadership and Endangered Its Security. Um, Today he's going to talk about the 90s, democracy with disarray, and uh, without further ado, I turn things over to Ambassador Matlock. Welcome. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, um, Professor Shapiro. And once again, I would say I'm quite honored uh, to be able to deliver uh, another lecture in the name of the Henry Stimson uh, series of lectures. Those of you who were here yesterday at the lecture must have been a little confused when I referred to the quotations on a sheet that I had assumed had been handed out. Turned out it wasn't handed out, but today I think you have it. And those quotations I will be referring to off and on uh, during the presentation. Some of them I agree with, some of them I don't agree with, but all of them are, I would say, fairly well-known, generally known comments on Russia that have been made um, in the 19th and uh, 20th centuries. Um, the earliest being a well-known quotation by de Tocqueville, uh, which comes from the end of his first volume of Democracy in America. And the quotation that I've really taken to be, you might say, the keynote theme of all four lectures, but the specific subject of the fourth is the one from uh, uh, from Stimson himself his communication to Truman when he said, we must find some way of persuading Russia to play ball. Now, obviously, this was 1945. The war was just ending. It hadn't yet ended in the Pacific. But it was clear to Stimson at that time that we were not going to have the sort of international order, the sort of post-World War II world, if the Soviet Union didn't cooperate. He called it Russia then. And that's another thing I wanted to distinguish, because when we talk about Russia, we have to bear in mind which Russia. So often, whether we're referring to Soviet Union or Tsarist Russia or the present Russian Federation, we refer just to Russia as if this was the same body. And as I pointed out yesterday, Russia has actually gone through four different sort of fundamentally <coughs> different types of governments over the last hundred years. A czarist autocracy, for a very, very brief period, an embryonic parliamentary system in 1917. Then a communist empire, not a Russian empire, because the Soviet Union was not a, though it occupied much of the same territory as the czarist empire, it really was a communist empire, uh, an, an ideologically, um, uh, an ideological empire rather than a national empire. And then we have the Russian Federation of today, uh, which is also multinational, but much greater proportion of ethnic Russians. Uh, in fact, close to 80% ethnic Russian, whereas in the Soviet Union, toward the end, uh, Russians were in a slight minority. I also yesterday talked a bit about the dangers of thinking in, in terms of opposites. 
um, thinking in terms of, well, is Russia Europe or something else? Uh, is Europe simply a synonym for a democratic country with a market economy? Uh, what does it mean if we speak of something European? Now, we know what the European Union is. This is a concrete area, and one can, I think, speak intelligibly about relations with the European Union. But arguments over whether Russia is Europe or European or not, I find not very productive. Because there is, when you generalize to the degree of the whole continent, you deprive it of most meaning, to be quite frank. Spain is quite different from Sweden, and, uh, and uh, Greece from uh, the UK. A lot of these are separate cultures. And when we put them all together as if there is a uniform culture there and Russia is not part of it, we really miss a lot of nuance. Russia, to be sure, is in answer to the question uh, I posed yesterday, sui generis, but so is every other country. And we've got to get beyond sort of the, the contrasts uh, that we often uh, put in sort of a theoretical way. Well, let's pick up today in the 1990s, the time when the Soviet Union broke up and the Russian Federation, the largest of its successor states, um, went through its first decade of existence. As I mentioned in the end yesterday, I thought the world had seen three geopolitically seismic events, had experienced them in the late 1980s, the very early 1990s. One was the end of the Cold War, and that ended well before the Soviet Union collapsed. One of the problems people have sometimes is simply fusing the two, assuming that somehow the end of the Cold War occurred when the Soviet Union collapsed. Absolutely wrong. Um, the Cold War ended as a result of cooperation between the United States and the Soviet Union and also between the United States and its allies and the Soviet leader. It was a negotiated end, and it was not anything resembling a military victory, as someone talked. It did end on terms that had been set by the United States and its allies, but these terms were calculated to be in the interest of a Soviet Union which would live in peace with its neighbors and not try to expand and force itself upon others. Uh, and it was in the interests of the Soviet leaders to accept these terms. So everything Gorbachev did was in the interests of the Soviet Union, and when he says we all won the Cold War, I would agree. Then you had the end of communist rule in the Soviet Union. This is not something that was brought down by Western pressure. It was brought down, end of communist rule, by the manipulation of the general secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, Mikhail Gorbachev, who took the party out of control of the country when he saw that the party was blocking the reforms that he wanted to have. And then, at the end of 91, we saw the Soviet Union itself break up, peacefully, except for some conflict around uh, the periphery. A uh, remarkable event. I think that uh, uh, many historians I've heard have said, you know, they can't think of another occasion where an empire of that size and so on just peacefully uh, uh, broke up. Now, uh, was this the result of Western pressure? Was this part of the so-called victory over the Cold War? Absolutely not. This was caused by internal forces in the Soviet Union. And uh, the idea that somehow it was U.S. pressure, particularly military or economic pressure, that brought down the Soviet Union gets it backwards. The American government tried to help Gorbachev preserve a voluntary union in those last months. We were unable to do it. We did not see, I'm speaking we, American officials, that it was in our interest to have the Soviet Union break up. 
we wanted it to change, we wanted, but, and we wanted the three Baltic states, which we had never recognized as part of the Soviet Union, to be given their independence uh, again. But the other 12 republics, we would have been more comfortable seeing them agree to a voluntary union. And uh, President Bush, the elder, made that clear in a speech in Kiev, August 1st, 1991. Well, it didn't happen. And yet, since then, myths have developed, which I think have confused not only us, but particularly Russians. And most Russians today would say, well, the West and the United States in particular brought down the Soviet <coughs> Union in order to dominate us. And many of the pictures one gives, one sees here, support that sort of myth. How many times when you see some portrayal <coughs> of the Berlin Wall being taken down, is it preceded by an image of Ronald Reagan standing in front of the Brandenburg Gate and saying, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. And then the next image is of the wall coming down. There was no cause and effect. Of course we wanted the wall to come down because that was part of it, but Reagan made that speech in 1987 at a time when we were still trying to get, uh, at that point, a, a treaty on nuclear weapons signed. It was signed in December of that year. But Reagan politically was trying to recover from, uh, from the uh, Iran-Contra uh, caper which damaged him politically and he was going to be leading us into signing a major treaty and persuading, he hoped, the Senate to ratify it, he had to be shown as still firmly anti-communist. Now, did that bring down the wall? Well, no. Actually, the wall came down a couple of years later and after quite different things happened. Mindful of Reagan's speech, which got a lot of uh, concern, the next year, uh, actually in 1989, uh, the first year that uh, George Bush the Elder was president, Bush planned a trip to Eastern Europe. Gorbachev was very concerned that there would be some of the same type of rhetoric, which actually, if there had been, would have made it much more difficult to do what he was trying to do. He was then pressuring the, the East Europeans, including the East Germans, to reform, the sort of reforms that could well bring down the wall. Now, if the American president is traveling in the area and making speeches like that, that makes it very politically difficult. So Gorbachev took me aside at a social occasion and said, you know, would you tell my friend George, by that time they were on a first name basis, to be a little more considerate the Russian word was vnimachny, uh, which can also mean attentive, but it, it, in this context it was considerate. And I said, well, you know, what do you have in mind? And he said, no, just tell him that. Well, I sent the message and, and Bush took it to heart. He traveled in through the very, several East European countries, not a word of direct criticism about the Soviet Union. After he left the visit, Shevardnadze, the foreign minister, call, called me over. I was over on another matter, and he said, by the way, uh, uh, President Gorbachev wants uh, President Bush to know that he appreciates the way he handled his uh, trip in Eastern Europe. In other words, <coughs> once we stopped the rhetoric and brought it down, and Gorbachev, with his reforms, started the process that eventually brought the wall down. But it was not Mr. Gorbachev who tore down that wall. It was the Germans who tore down that wall. And that's another thing that I would say juxtaposing these two images as if there was cause and effect leaves entirely the wrong impression. Pardon me for going into such detail, but I did want to uh, 
get across the idea that some of these myths that we have about how the Cold War ended and what it means really twist it in a way which I think uh, has turned out to be dangerous for our own uh, foreign policy. Now George Bush, besides on the one hand keeping the rhetoric cool uh, regarding Eastern Europe, and you may recall that when he was asked why he didn't say more about the Berlin Wall coming down, he said, I'm not going to go dance on the wall. I'm not going to make political capital out of this. Uh, and this was actually one of the essential things to keep these reforms going. If the American president had started crowing about it, look, we're forcing to do this, forcing to do that, that process might have stopped right off. Uh, well, we didn't. So we saw during the Bush administration, first of all, a confirmation that the Cold War was really over. Philosophically, I think it was over when Gorbachev gave a speech at the United Nations in December 1988. Because in that speech, he renounced implicitly the class, international class struggle as the foundation of Soviet foreign policy and explicitly reversed the Brezhnev Doctrine by saying that every country should have an untrammeled right, an unrestricted right, to decide its form of government. That, of course, was the opposite of the Soviet attitude in the Brezhnev Doctrine, where if a country had, was once socialist, it was the obligation of other socialist countries to keep counter-revolution from removing it. And as a result, you got the invasions of Hungary, of Czechoslovakia, of Afghanistan uh, in, in succession. But Bush uh, continued many of the policies uh, that had been, uh, uh, had been uh, enunciated during the Reagan administration. And we, we got s several major arms control agreements. Most significantly, geopolitically, was that he was able to negotiate Soviet support in the United Nations to authorize the war uh, to liberate Kuwait, the first Gulf War. One of the greatest contrasts in diplomacy, if you want to make a comparison, is what we did diplomatically before the first Gulf War and what we didn't do diplomatically uh, uh, when we invaded Iraq um, in uh, 2000 and was it three now? Um, in any event, that took fairly intense diplomacy, and I won't delay us with, with all of the, uh, uh, the details at this point, except to say that it was diplomacy and that there was no reason to assume at the beginning of that that when Saddam Hussein advanced into Kuwait and took it over, that the Soviet Union was not going to support Saddam Hussein. He had been their ally. They had armed him. There were over 8,000 Soviet specialists um, for the military equipment then in Iraq and persuading them to condemn this and then vote in the UN to use all necessary means, I think that was the phrase, to remove Iraqi troops from Kuwait, I think was a diplomatic achievement of, of great uh, uh, moment. Uh, it was really Secretary of State ba uh, Baker, Jim Baker, who, who, who did most of the actual diplomacy. Uh, but the fact is that this told us something that many of us had already felt after Gorbachev's speech and other actions, that is the Cold War really was over. And when you have them uh, you know, authorizing the United States to lead a coalition against one of their erstwhile allies, that shows that things have changed and changed pretty drastically. Now, as East Europe liberated itself, the Berlin Wall came down. The question immediately arose, well, what happens to Germany? It was one thing for a Soviet government to allow countries that had been communists 
to throw out their communist governments. Um, but it was another thing to allow the two German states, which for many Soviet citizens, the fact that Germany was divided and that they in effect controlled the eastern part, uh, one of the primary evidences that they won World War II. And suddenly, the question was, will you give that up? The big issue really was not so much will there be unity at some point, but under what conditions? At first, the first few weeks after the Berlin Wall came down, the Soviet leaders really seemed to think that you could get a, you know, a more liberal communist regime in the German Democratic Republic, which could hold on, at least for a while. And as they put it, you know, unification is an issue for the future. They thought it didn't have to happen on their watch. And I would say in early December 89, uh, this really was the attitude. I recall calling on Shabernadze, the foreign minister, just after we got back to Moscow from the summit meeting in Malta that Bush had had. And I asked him about German unification. He said, well, you know, we think it's going to happen in the future, but it is a question for the future. Later that month, I called on Ambassador Fahlin, who had been their ambassador in West Germany and then was head of the International Department of the Central Committee. And I asked him the same question. And he said, we thought this was going to be a question for the future, but we see it is one that's going to be resolved now. This was in the course of December, in a space of about three weeks. And, but at that point, they made two conditions. They wanted, first of all, they wanted the unity to be negotiated between the two German states. And second, uh, that therefore it be a negotiated uh, a settlement, assuming that the government in the East Germany would in effect represent their interests. And the second was that if there was German unity, Germany had to leave NATO. You could not have a united Germany in NATO. And this became a crucial issue. Now the matter of negotiation by the two German states became moot after the Christian Democrats won the election in East Germany in early March. Of, uh, uh, of 1990, but the question of a united Germany in NATO uh, remained very much there. And Baker addressed this question directly with Gorbachev in February 90, when he posed a question which he said, look, I want you to think about this. You don't have to give me an immediate answer. But assuming there is no expansion of NATO jurisdiction to the east, not one inch. Wouldn't it be better to have a united Germany anchored in NATO with all of the implications that that has than one which is free in the future to go its own way? Now, he didn't say specifically to go nuclear, to get nuclear weapons. This was clearly what he had in mind. And he added, NATO is the only legal reason we have troops in Europe. Most Europeans feel that this helps stabilize the situation. Again, he didn't say keep Germany under control, but that's what he meant. Uh, and uh, wouldn't we all be better off if that continues? Gorbachev's answer was, of course, any expansion of NATO to the east would be unacceptable. But the other points you make are very important, and I'm going to take them seriously. And then he added, as far as American presence in Europe, I want you to know we are not trying to expel you from Europe anymore. There was one time that was part of our policy. But we recognize that an American military presence can be stabilizing. He said, no, you know, you probably don't need 300,000 troops. But uh, we'd like to see, you know, fewer. But we understand that you have a role to play and we want you here. 
I told Baker as we were riding back to the embassy, you've got him. You know, he's going to buy this. But the point I'm making now is he bought this with understanding no expansion to the east. We'll let Germany stay in. Well, the details were worked out later. There are other details here which I, uh, I won't go into now. Uh, essentially, when Baker made the statement, he also had in mind that even the territory of the German Democratic Republic would not be in NATO. He had come through Bonn, had talked to Foreign Minister Genscher, and it was Genscher's idea. When Baker got back to Washington, it turned out that the lawyers told him, look, that's it, you can't do that. Uh, so later in our negotiations, it was made clear that the GDR territory would become part of NATO, and this was made clear in the negotiations. But his initial statement was a very flat one. He didn't limit it to the GDR. Uh, and, uh, and yet Gorbachev never asked for any formal assurance. Maybe none could have been given. But I can testify as one who was very much involved in some of these negotiations. It didn't cross any of our minds at that time that the United States would ever, or West Europe, would ever find it in its interest to expand NATO to the east. Now, this is the perspective of 1990. Now, uh, the, this um, was really an implicit deal with Gorbachev, and it was carried over with Yeltsin as long as, as the Bush administration uh, was in power. <coughs> The Soviet Union collapsed, even though the Bush had tried to give a voluntary union uh, a push. Uh, Bush was able very quickly to bond with Yeltsin, uh, to the point that when I visited uh, Yeltsin researching uh, my book on the Soviet collapse in October uh, of, um, of 1992, one of the first things he said is, tell my friend George I'm praying that he'll win the election. I was able to tell him that, well, you know, if the polls hold, he may not, but I believe the next president will be equally, uh, uh, equally friendly to Russia. Uh, but um, at that time, uh, he, uh, I would say, uh, Bush and Yeltsin uh, were able to develop a, a, a relationship just about as confidential and uh, and, and, and confident as the one uh, that uh, Bush had with Gorbachev. After the Soviet Union collapsed, Russia went through simultaneously three profound revolutions. I, again, I, I don't know that one can find another, and, and certainly another large country that has been confronted simultaneously with such radical change. There was the political rev uh, uh, revolution replacing the Communist Party with what was at least formally a, a democratic system, uh, an elected system with a real legislature, uh, with at least theoretically independent judiciary, uh, and so on, and simply replacing the sort of rule they had under the Communists, which, as I mentioned yesterday, was like a criminal organization ruling the country through a front organization, which happened to be uh, the formal government. Uh, instead, the elected government became <laughs> the real government to the degree it was a government. 180 degree turn. Economics, from a totally state-controlled economy, they went to a market economy from an economy where everything had been planned in the center, where it was illegal to own any property that was used to make a profit. Uh, you could only own certain very limited personal property. Uh, and, um, and it was illegal to sell something for more than you paid for it. That was speculation. It was illegal to hire somebody to do work for you because that was exploitation. And only the state could do these things, and suddenly you get the opposite. Uh, and, and you get a sudden 
attempt at privatization in a country where there was no legitimate private capital. How do you do that? What private capital there was, uh, was from the black market. And, well, what happened in effect was uh, those who had access, maybe because of their party connections, maybe because of their KGB connections, maybe because of their military connections, grabbed what they could. Uh, and for the average person, it was a total disaster. Inflation in 1992 was a couple of thousand percent. In effect, savings were wiped out. The average person did have savings. Pensions were very low, and even people toward the bottom of, of the scale would have saved a few thousand rubles for their old age. And suddenly this became worthless. Uh, not only that, the government didn't have enough money even to pay the pensions often. Nor did many of the employers. You had sometimes going months without people getting paid. And perhaps the, so you had a political revolution, an economic revolution, but the one that maybe was deepest was the revolution that had to do with the self-image. What does it mean to be Russian? Is it an ethnic term? Is it a political term? Has Russian lost half its people because it's naturally an empire? Or have the Russian people finally gained control of their destiny, which before had been in the hands of this ideological uh, empire? And the interesting thing is that often these conflicting views existed in the breast of the same person. Uh, it wasn't just some groups thought one and other groups thought the other. There was a real feeling of, you know, what, what, what does it mean to be Russian? Something that, for example, I think a Chinese would never question. I think Frenchmen never question what it means to be French. Any question. But you really had a period of considerable self-doubt and so on, and whether what had happened was good. At first, you know, getting the Communist Party out of power was extraordinarily popular. And then suddenly, you have chaos. You lose your job. The institutions are not there. Things that were a crime before are now required to get along. And what's more, the president starts fighting with the parliament. In 1993, at one point, the tension got so strong that the leaders of parliament, operating actually without a quorum, because some who were favorable to President Yeltsin left, uh, then actually tried to take over the government by force, occupying the mayor's office and then attacking the television tower, until Yeltsin brought in an army unit and shelled the parliament. Not a, a pretty picture. Uh, I was, shortly after that, I was in Moscow and being interviewed, and I was asked, could you imagine the American president ever shelling the Congress? And I said, no, but I can't imagine the Congress trying to raise an army and take over Washington. Uh, you know, <laughs> these things just are not supposed to happen. Uh, but, uh, but really, what Russians saw in the 90s, after the fall of the Soviet Union, was instability bordering on anarchy, the spread of organized crime, and bureaucratic corruption. It was truly a Hobbesian world, and success seemed to require deceit, lack of scruples, and not just a matter of using your elbows, but going even further than that, uh, doing in your associates and neighbors. The economy was near collapse. State assets, and everything had been state-owned, tended to be uh, 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 simply stolen. And I've already mentioned the non-payment of wages and pensions and the disappearances of savings. So uh, the impact, I think, on most Russian opinion was very, very strong. People said this was democracy. And if you, you know, since then, 
there have been a number of polls and you'll find that Russians would say by a considerable majority they don't want democracy. Now, if you ask them, do you want to be able to vote for your government? Do you want to be able to travel freely? Do you want, if you break it down to things, you'll get overwhelming yes on all of those things. But democracy to many means the chaos, the near anarchy of which they experienced in the 90s. You know, even before the 90s, uh, I think this was in late 90 or 91, Rebecca and I were in the Crimea. We had a visit of an American uh, naval ship, first time since World War II. And one of the officers of the Black Sea Fleet took us on a cutter along the coast of the Crimea, and we stopped in Yalta, and the mayor took us around town. And there it was a nice summer day, nice and warm, and people were out swimming in the Black Sea. But there was an area in the beach with a big sign up, danger, no swimming. There must have been 20 people in that area swimming. And I asked the mayor, well, you know, don't you enforce your safety rules? And he said, oh, we have democracy now. We can't tell people what to do. <laughs> so somehow the idea of what democracy was, uh, you know, came to be, you know, it just anything goes. Uh, now, what about American policy during this period of the 90s and how it, you might say, interacted with what was happening in Russia? I might say that uh, a very good book, I think, on, on the policy, which looks at it, I think, in depth from the American point of view, is a recent one by uh, James Goldgeier and Michael McFall. It's called Power and Purpose. Uh, very insightful on, American, on the American side, I think somewhat less so on the Russian side, uh, and they make it clear in their introduction that uh, their emphasis has been on the American side. Uh, so those who want to pursue this in detail, I can certainly recommend that as sort of a, uh, a, a very good uh, text in hitting the, uh, the main points. Well, at first with uh, uh, President Clinton, you had talk of a partnership with Russia uh, for uh, at least a partnership for reform. There was immediate reaction back here, premature partnership, they're not worthy of it, etc. They're not ready for it. But increasingly, although uh, President Clinton tried to maintain good relations uh, uh, with Yeltsin and generally could get his way with Yeltsin, uh, Yeltsin, increasingly weak politically in Russia, needed the American support. If he had lost that, you know, things could have gotten very mad. So in that sense, uh, I think Clinton was able, in effect, to roll Yeltsin and to push him on almost every point uh, that we thought uh, was important to us or, or to others. But in effect, we started treating Russia as a defeated country. There was a strong feeling of triumphalism. We won the Cold War. Some of the commentators, when issues would come up, would say, you know, we won the Cold War. We can do what we want. Uh, Russia doesn't count anymore. Oh, look how disorderly they are. Their army is worth nothing. They can't even bring order to Chechnya, uh, in that, uh, one of their smallest provinces. Uh, and, you know, we can ignore them. Uh, and that really seemed to be the attitude. Uh, what economic advice we gave was not all that great, quite frankly. We were already becoming enamored of, uh, uh, of sort of market supremacy. You know, you just get your property in private hands and establish a market economy and everything's going to be fine and keep the government out of it. The last thing you want is any government intervention. Well, you know, the, the Russians were, they're, they're grown, they're adults. They, if, what, if they took the advice, it's their responsibility. But frankly, much of the advice was not really very well suited for conditions that they had. Uh, and uh, the, particularly the way they went through the privatization, which turned out to be more a matter of theft than a matter of what we would consider privatization, that is the private sector buying state assets at, you know, more or less market prices. Uh, you didn't have a private sector, a legal one, uh, that, to buy the th stuff. Uh, and, of course, the whole privatization came to be called in Russian uh, 
privatizacija. Uh, Russia has the same loan word that we do for privatization, privatizacija, but hvata in Russian is to grab. So privatizacija was gravification. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, the assets seemed to be up for grabs. And it was the United States and West that was endorsing all of this, even encouraging it in their eyes. Uh, well, so gradually what turned out from the early 90s, polls that showed that 80% or more of the Russian people considered the United States the most admired country in the world, the country to which uh, uh, they would like to aspire. By the end of the 90s, at the time we were bombing Serbia over Kosovo, the polls were exactly the opposite, with 80% saying the United States was the most dangerous country in the world. Now, I, I want to point this out because this change in opinion occurred before Vladimir Putin. It occurred in the 90s. It occurred when there was still talk of Russia being in a transition to democracy. And it was a time when the freedoms in Russia, in, in many respects, were greater than they are today. But even then, they were not greater than they were in the last year of the Soviet Union. Uh, that last year of Gorbachev, uh, people were even freer than they were in the 90s because there was still was at least some semblance of order uh, rather than the sort of chaos they had in the 90s. But then in the late 90s, the United States, in my opinion, made some strategic blunders. One was the decision for NATO enlargement. That's the reason I spend as much time as I do on the Bush administration, cultivation of Gorbachev and leaving the impression, which was a genuine one, that if they left Eastern Europe, they let them go, we were not going to seem to take advantage of that geopolitically by simply moving in a military alliance. I would say, by the way, the Russians have not objected to the enlargement of the European Union. Perhaps that's even more important, certainly is more important to the Central and East Europeans than, than NATO. But they do see NATO as a military alliance, despite the various changes that have occurred since the World War, a military alliance commanded by the United States. And uh, such agreements as they have with NATO doesn't really seem to give them a voice when it comes to decisions that affect them. Um, now, this was all quite predictable. I was one of a number of people who very strongly advised against moving NATO enlargement that way. The question was not whether we should find a way to reassure the Poles and the Czechs and the other East Europeans and the three Baltic states that we would protect them from future aggression. There were a number of ways that could be done. And even the Russians told us officially, look, if you want to extend NATO guarantees to these countries, fine. If you want to have the partnership of peace, cooperation of the military, that's fine. What really we have to object to is bringing them into a central military alliance in which their military is actually becomes part of an overall American commanded uh, military establishment. Um, and yet that is precisely what was done. Now, when we did it, we said, you don't have to worry, good heavens, this is, this is a purely defensive alliance and we know you're not threatening uh, these countries and we, we, we have no doubt that you are gonna th you're not gonna threaten them in the future, so why should you worry? NATO is constitutionally incapable of an offensive operation. And what happens in 1999, when we couldn't get a vote in the United Nations to use military force to protect the Kosovars, NATO, without UN approval, decides to bomb Serbia. Now mind you, not to send in troops to protect the Kosovars, but to make war against Serbia. And the Russian had to say, you know, what's going on? This is your defensive alliance? 
you're using it as a substitute for the UN. Now the problem with this diplomacy is if we had not expanded NATO, if we had found other mechanisms for reassuring the East Europeans, and most of all had encouraged the EU to bring them into that economic arrangement, which they certainly needed, almost certainly Russia, number one, would have pressured Milosevic to cool it in Kosovo and give them, you know, or failing that, would have voted with us in the UN to authorize it. So, you know, one thing sort of led to another. And uh, at this point, um, the, uh, uh, the Russians, of course, began to look at very great uh, uh, skepticism at the American claims. And, but the message overall, I think, was a more general one, is that we're not going to accept you as equals. We're not going to accept you in the West. We're not going to treat you like we do the other Europeans. We consider you a threat because you're weak. Um, then if we think about the whole nuclear policy, what was the central issue during the Cold War with the Soviet Union? Nuclear weapons. The fact is that at the height of the Cold War, each of us probably had enough weapons that if they were used, would have destroyed human life on Earth seven times over. Not once, not twice. Each of us. At one point, there was probably in existence something like 60,000 nuclear warheads. Well, we were getting the numbers down, and both Gorbachev and Reagan were united in one thing, and that was they should move the world toward the elimination of nuclear weapons. These are weapons that simply have no rational military use. And that process had gotten a pretty good start with Reagan and Gorbachev and then with Bush the first and Gorbachev. Uh, we had a strategic arms agreement uh, signed which cut all the strategic arms by 50% and destroyed them with verification, very strict verification. And then another agreement was signed, a start two, uh, in the last uh, uh, months of the, uh, of the Bush administration, the first Bush administration. And then everything sort of stalled. Start two never really got ratified. It was, uh, uh, it, uh, the Duma, Russian Duma kept holding it up because of things like NATO expansion, because of things like the bombing of Serbia. And finally they ratified only under condition that the ABM treaty not be uh, disturbed. And of course, the second Bush administration walked out of the ABM treaty, which means that the second start agreement never came into force. The first one, by the way, runs out this year and has not been renewed. Um, we had a program that was actually first pushed by Congress, by Senators Nunn and Lugar, the so-called Nunn-Lugar program, which has been a very useful one, uh, with aid to the safety of nuclear weapons in Russia. But the fact is that both the United States and Russia throughout the 90s and to this day have thousands of nuclear warheads on operational alert. <coughs> Does it make any sense? There are not even any targets for them. And yet, when you have them, it's sort of like riding a tiger. You, you, if you take them off unilaterally, what's the other side going to do? Are they going to take advantage of it? As far as I can tell, we have not, since the first Bush administration, negotiated seriously on those and on a number of other nuclear issues. And the f so what remains now is a standoff. In a sense, we do have an agreement for further reductions that was signed in 2002 uh, by the second Bush administration, but it is an agreement without any verification. 
And also, the United States announced that, well, we won't be destroying all these we take off. We're going to store some in case we need them in the future. What in the world are you going to need them for in the future? How do you plan to use them? And then the Bush administration announced that, well, they really needed to develop some new nuclear weapons, like weapons that could attack underground facilities, like the sort that may exist in Iran. Um, well, some of this has, been, has not been funded by Congress, but the fact is we have gone from a policy on both sides of, of moving toward getting rid of these things, and yet today when nobody seems to be paying any attention, <laughs> serious attention to this issue, the U.S. and Russia still own nearly 95% of the existing nuclear weapons in the world, and yet we're telling other countries, you can't have them. And yet the Non-Proliferation Treaty obligates the countries with them to move them down, the numbers down, with a goal of zero as part of their obligation. So when we are not dealing with this issue, how do we expect to deal with the Non-Proliferation issue uh, 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 effectively? Well, this is a question, and I'll get back to it. Uh, later when we, when we look at particularly at the current situation. But to get to the question that the title of my talk today was, you know, is it democracy or disarray in the 90s? One would really have to say it was much more disarray than democracy. And therefore, people who characterize, and many of them have, the move, uh, developments in Putin's Russia, uh, since he became president in 2000, as backtracking on democracy. And this was actually a phrase used in one of the working groups that the Council on Foreign Relations uh, had. I would say, come on, backtracking on democracy? That wasn't democracy. It was true that in the 90s, in a formal sense, they had elections and it was fairly easy to get a party uh, registered, and now it's <laughs> not so easy. Uh, campaigning was quite open, um, and so on. And actually, as far as we can tell, the counting of the votes was reasonably honest. But did a person get the feeling that their representative in the Duma could do anything for them to represent their interests? Most of them were bribed by somebody else. Uh, and, and, uh, and even if they hadn't been, you know, they, didn't, they really weren't set up for the sort of, of uh, constituent services that we're accustomed to, for example. Uh, I asked one of my friends who was elected to the Duma twice from Murmansk uh, what he thought of Putin's ruling at one point, and he got the Constitution actually changed, uh, uh, for this, uh, that all their representatives should be elected on a party slate rather than representing districts like our congressmen do. Originally, in the Russian Federation, half the Duma members were elected in constituencies and half on party slates. And then Putin said they should all be on party slates. Well, this obviously, if you control the parties, that have them, then this uh, enables you to control uh, the people represented and they don't represent districts. I thought my friend would be outraged by this. He said, Jack, you know, I had two terms there. There wasn't a thing I could do for my constituents because that's not how the system worked. He said, unless you could work through a party, he was from one of the smaller parties, nothing got done. So it, you know, it didn't benefit my constituents, it didn't benefit me. And he said, maybe this will be better because it will maybe encourage more consolidation of the parties. Well, actually it's had a different effect. But uh, my, uh, my point is that what the Russians experienced was not a very pleasant experience. And it's quite normal that, it seems to me, that they turned against actually many of the ideas of democracy. And this leads me also to 
speak a little bit, and I know I mentioned this yesterday as well, about what I would call the limitations of freedom as an objective. Um, obviously, this is, I think, a very laudable American desire to see other people free. And I'm, I am one who believes that most people do want to be free. But can people be free if they don't know where the next meal is coming from? Can they be free if lawbreakers act without restraint and the whole neighborhood is, uh, you know, is controlled by uh, mafia mobs who, uh, uh, who, if you get in debt to them and don't pay off, you'll lose your life? How much respect will they have for a political system in which elected representatives are powerless to act in their interests? And I, so it means that if you look at the sort of charts that Freedom House has, and these are useful, if they leave out the economic performance, the social safety net, even such things as law and order uh, on the streets, you leave out a very important element of people's attitude toward their government. Uh, and the fact is that in terms of a safety net, in terms of avoiding, after they got out through Stalin's purges and so on, avoiding sort of uh, mass lawlessness at the local level, uh, the Soviets did a pretty good job. Uh, people, at least, they might have limits in what they did. There might be many things in our lives that were more directed. But, you know, by the 70s, the 80s, people were uh, at least not falling through the safety net in large numbers, and life was generally orderly and predictable. Obviously, if you feel oppressed, you, predictability maybe doesn't mean very much. But in the sort of situation Russians faced in the 90s, predictability became, or the lack of predictability, became one of the biggest complaints. Um, and when Putin took office in 2000, what can one say about Russian attitudes? First of all, the feeling of defeat and humiliation and what seemed to be Western contempt, or if not contempt, even possibly hostility, uh, was very general. They felt a rejection, not only by the East European countries, and maybe they half expected that, but also by the people in the Baltics uh, and particularly the Georgians. I think for Russians, the fact that the Georgians began treating them as enemies was sort of the unkindest cut of all because they had the feeling they had always treated the Georgians well. Uh, the Georgian nobility was taken into the Russian nobility from the time Georgia came part of uh, the Russian Empire in the early 19th century. And Georgians had played a very prominent role, <laughs> including, in the case of Stalin, uh, the supreme leader. So almost the insult to their feeling of national integrity and definition of them all when so many of the non-Russian nationalities seemed to be turning against them, I think was very hard psychologically to take. Uh, the so-called democratic system simply wasn't working. Future was uncertain, everything unpredictable. Now, going back to my theme yesterday, is Russia East or West, European, non-European, by nature authoritarian, resistant to democracy and democratic practices? Many people find evidence for that, but I would ask one question. If Americans had experienced what Russians did in the 1990s, would they have supported a more authoritarian regime? And we have a partial answer. After 9-11, a tragic occurrence, but one nowhere near as shattering or threatening or humiliating that's what Russians went through in the 90s. We found that Americans did 
acquiesce to, and in many cases support, distinctly more authoritarian practices by their government. So how different is Russia? Um, when you look at the context, when you look at what they went through, and how they interpreted, not entirely unfairly, what considered at best the indifference, at worst the hostility of the West, which they had aspired to become part of, then I think you do see a country that was ready for Vladimir Putin. And when I come back in a couple of weeks, we'll talk about what happened then. Thank you very much. I'll be happy. My hearing is not very good, so speak either loud or Professor Shapiro can repeat it for me. <laughs> Why do you think that the project of enlarging NATO was resumed under the Clinton administration, which one might have thought would have been a rather less hawkishly inclined one than its predecessors? You know, um, James Goldgeier, one of the co-authors of one of the books I recommended, wrote a whole book about that called Not Whether But When. Um, I think, in my own opinion, it was almost 100% domestic politics. First of all, when the Republicans won uh, the election in, uh, let's see, it would be 94, when Newt Gingrich became a speaker, one of the points in the contract with America was we should expand NATO. So you were getting political pressure from the Republicans at that point. Um, these were not the Bush one Republicans, but the Bush two Republicans, I would say. Uh, and I know that when I would go up to Congress and testify against it, and testify the reasons we shouldn't do this, I would often be taken aside by others who were up and said, Get real. There's no way this administration is not going to go for an expansion of NATO. And this was actually in 1996. He said, look where the East European votes are. Pennsylvania, Illinois. The Poles, particularly the Poles in the United States and also the Ukrainians, other East Europeans were all gung-ho to get their countries in NATO. And they said, you know, Clinton, if he wins that 96 election, and it looked as if it was going to be close, he needs Pennsylvania and Illinois. You know, there's no way he's going to, and that's when he promised, you know, that NATO, it was not whether but when. Uh, and there were probably other reasons, too. Uh, I know former Senator Bill Bradley, who also thinks this was a huge mistake, uh, told me he thought, well, it went beyond that, that Clinton was really looking for something that looked like his own foreign policy. And since he was being pushed politically, uh, that, uh, that was something to do. But it was clear that before that, when we developed the Partnership for Peace, where you could have a great degree of military cooperation uh, with uh, the partners without actually bringing them in the alliance, it looked as if this was designed in order to allow NATO not to expand. But then suddenly, you got the decision, and then everything else was really set up and prearranged. Uh, when Joe Biden, uh, in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, set up his hearings, you always had six to argue in favor and four of us to argue against it. And later, when he spoke at the Council on Foreign Relations, uh, he started out by saying, you know, we've had more people testifying for rather than against. And then he laughed and said, well, of course, that doesn't mean very much because we select whom we invite. <laughs> but uh, uh, the thing is, it was, the, the political fix was on by both parties. And the basic reason was had much more to do with internal politics than it did with really a, a careful thought about what the impact for our foreign policy is going to be. As I said, the attitude was, heck, we won the Cold War. Uh, you know, Russia is defeated, even though Russia wasn't even a party to the Cold War. 
Russia was one of the colonies of the Soviet Empire. And actually, I know that Yeltsin and the Russian leaders helped us really were closer to American policy than even Gorbachev those last two years. So they helped us in the Cold War uh, with their political influence. Uh, but this was all forgotten. I would say that I think if President Herbert Walker Bush had been reelected, I don't believe he would have expanded NATO in his second term. Now, maybe his successor would have, uh, but I, I don't think he would have. Knowing that uh, their you know policies changed between administrations, why was uh, why was there the decision to not formalize the non-expansion of NATO? I I didn't you catch it. Say <laughs> um, why was the agreement uh, or uh, non-agreement? Uh, or, I'm sorry. Uh, why why did we decide not to formalize the uh, non-expansion of NATO? Oh, we didn't decide not to formalize uh, non-expansion of NATO. Uh, Gorbachev never asked us to formalize it. I must say he had a lot of things on his mind, and I'm not sure how legally we could have. In a sense, you know, one administration without an, a treaty can't bind subsequent administrations. And actually, even with a treaty, since treaties always have a way out, you can't bind subsequent administrations. I mean, one of the things that uh, uh, the Bush-Cheney administration, they walked out of the ABM treaty. Uh, I mean, uh, but every treaty that we have, uh, you know, it, it, the Senate wouldn't pass them if they didn't have some provision that you could leave them if need, need be. Uh, so even if we had had a treaty, I don't know how you could really effectively bind them. Uh, but, you know, it wasn't just the United States. The Secretary General of NATO made public statements at the time uh, that NATO had reached its fullest extent, and in return for allowing a united Germany to stay a member, there would be no further expansion. This is a quote that uh, uh, just recently Putin, uh, when he was talking about you know, uh, uh, the idea of Georgia and Ukraine in NATO, uh, actually quoted back the, the statement that uh, Secretary General Verna had made uh, back at that time. So it wasn't just the United States. But these were not legal commitments. Given that NATO has been expanded, um, and it's a, there's nothing we can really do about it at this point, what would your suggestion for U.S. foreign policy in the region be? Should NATO be disbanded? Should Russia be invited to join NATO? Well, I have, I'll be talking about that in greater detail in, my, in the fourth lecture. But just briefly, um, I think certainly there should be no further expansion. And in NATO's own interest, I don't think either Georgia or Ukraine qualify, even aside from Russian attitudes. I think either one stops where we are, and with NATO, and uh, sort of an equally sore issue with the Russians, if we decide not to put, or at least to delay, uh, the missile interceptors in Poland, uh, I believe that then certain other agreements would, would become possible as far as the Russians are concerned. I think that's sort of minimal. Now, in the long run, I think we really do have to look at, is NATO serving our interests? And I'm not sure we're taking yet a good look at that. It seemed to me in the 90s that we should have been, as a United States policy, shifting most responsibility for European security, including the Balkans, to Europe and Russia, including Russia, and actually using our influence to encourage the Europeans and Russians to set up a security organization that, that would be associated with NATO, but in effect would relieve us of much of the, uh, of the responsibility there. I think there are more liabilities there than, than assets to be made from it. And in fact, by expanding NATO the way we did, we did not even show Russians the consideration we showed Germans after World War II, when our policy was to insist that Britain and France accept Germany as an equal in NATO. Now, the reason was the Soviet threat, perhaps. And this was not an easy thing for them to do, 
But Germany, which was defeated, which did attack us, we use our influence to reconcile them with the former enemies. Instead, with the Russians, we bring in the countries in Eastern Europe who have grievances and are obviously going to be a, a problem if they're on one side or the, or the other, and leave Russia out. So, I mean, it was just completely lacking in any, I would say, in any vision for the sort of world you want to have. Now, right now, when we can't even get NATO to put up an extra thousand troops for Afghanistan, uh, it's not, and it's also clear that uh, each individual country is going to decide whether they support us militarily if we need military help elsewhere. I'm not sure what advantages we're getting out of NATO. And I think we should be thinking about, well, shouldn't it at least have a European commander? Uh, shouldn't we encourage them to expand the European defense community as part of NATO at first? And maybe that's one that you can work a more cooperative relationship with Russia. I think right now Russia would not want to be in NATO unless it has some special status because they really look at us, you know, and, and let's face it, their military is probably not you know, uh, is, is, uh, is yet would require such a, a, a reorganization uh, that that's probably not a very feasible thing. But back in the 90s when it was asked, well, why don't we just bring in Russia? I know the Russian answer was, we're not going to stand in line behind Bulgaria. I mean, they, have, uh, they do have a feeling that they are something special and they're not going to simply join an alliance if it means subordination to the United States. Yes, yes. This is a, a wonderful lecture, and it's always fascinating to hear someone speak on a subject who's actually part of the making of the story that he's telling and analyzing. But let me, uh, let me ask a question, see if I understood basically the main thrust here. It seems to me that what you were saying is that we really played our hand well in the Gorbachev era, and that U.S. policy really uh, contributed to the positive movement that was happening in a good way. And then we come to the 1990s, uh, the breakup of the Soviet Union, and the U.S. starts to make blunders in its policy toward the Soviet Union. And there's a certain implication in the way you present the case that the fact that things got so bad in the 90s are to some extent a result of our diplomacy. And then you conclude, you say that, well, if we had experienced such disorder, it makes sense that the Russians would, would be tolerant of, if not in favor of, something more authoritarian. If you needed to weigh the relative importance of the U.S. policy in this period in contributing to the negative outcome, how would you, how much importance do you give to it? In other words, to what extent are you really uh, holding us responsible uh, to some extent for what you are presenting as an understandable uh, aftermath of the 1990s. I wish that there was some way one could evaluate the proportionate influence of various influences. I don't know any way to do it. All I can say is that I think our policies of the 90s made it harder internally for the democratic forces to prevail. That's number one. Number two, I do think that our, our policies in the 90s helped contribute to the virulence of some of the Russian nationalism that we see today. Now, I'm not going to say that these things would not have happened anyway, even if our policies had been different. I don't know. Um, obviously, there are so very, very many variables there. And as I mentioned uh, you know, yesterday, um, you know, in retrospect, everything looks a little more definite than it does at the time, uh, because you can never really predict precisely how things are going to play out. Now, I think in the case of NATO expansion, it was possible to predict that this would play out in a negative way, both domestically in Russia and particularly in Russia's relationship with us. On the other hand, if we had simply stopped with Poland, Czech Republic, or then, and Hungary, uh, not continued the process and had not attacked Serbia, it may have, might, might have become a non-issue. 
uh, so, you know, there's so many variables here. But basically, on your question, I would say, first of all, I think American policy toward Russia has been much more important to Russia than Russian policy has been toward the United States. We have been more or less immune in our domestic politics uh, from things that they, you know, they have done. Uh, and uh, in, in that sense, whereas I think the image of the United States and the relationship with the United States has played a, a, a rather large role in the image the Russians have of themselves. And, um, and uh, you know, both pro and con. And I do think that much of the, of the nationalism does stem from a feeling of rejection. Uh, either by the West or the United States. I, I know this is your field and you can tell me more than, than I know about it, but I had the feeling, for example, uh, uh, yesterday I talked about Tuchev's poem, which ends, Rasiu Mojna Toyka Vierich. You can only believe in Russia. Russia cannot be measured by normal standards. That this was really a reaction to the fact that they couldn't meet the sort of standards they saw in Western Europe, so you retreat to a feeling that you, you have a special essence, a special spirituality, which outsiders really can't understand, but you're really better. And that played into Spanslavism, it plays into Dostoevsky's ideas, uh, and, and so on. Um, but, so I think, you know, this, this is a real strain in Russian thinking, but it did seem to me it comes also, it is, enhanced by, you know, a feeling of, of rejection, of not being accepted. And therefore, you know, we'll never be like the West. Let's be ourselves. We're different. We're better in other respects. Uh, you know, for different reasons, Americans also seem to have a feeling that we're special. I mean, we're for democracy, and if we do something for democracy, people should understand that and should understand we're not imperialists. We don't attack another country unless they're bad guys and we're trying to make them Democrats. Well, you know, um, so I, I really don't know. I, I, I don't think there's any way one can say, because one thing, you can't say things would be markedly different if our policy had been different. But I, I think that democracy and the democratic procedures would have had a better chance if our policies had been different. Well, Keith, we'll get the last question. Hi, <laughs> yes. You talked a lot about our relationship with Gorbachev, but what about our relationship with Yeltsin? To a certain extent, you know, he was more responsible for bringing down the, the party and to a certain extent breaking up the union uh, than Gorbachev. Did we have ties with him? Were we playing both of those figures equally in your experience? Or, or what was the relationship? Well, uh, uh, the relationship with Yeltsin, if you mean during the Soviet Union. Yeah. The Bush administration was very wary of Yeltsin at first. And uh, they, he made a bad impression in his first trip to the United States. Um, I made a point as ambassador to maintain a personal relationship with him. Rebecca and I would invite him and his wife and along with Korshakov, his security guard, and his wife, uh, to come to private dinners. And so having seen him when he was out, I was always able to see him and, and, and talk over the issues when he became more and more important. And it was hard to convince Washington that they should deal with him directly, but uh, because they considered him very erratic and, 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 and also they didn't want to give Yelk, uh, uh, Gorbachev the idea that somehow they were playing both sides. Uh, so, uh, and as late as Bush's trip to Moscow in July 91, by that time, Yeltsin had been elected president of the Russian uh, uh, Federation. Obviously, he had to see him, but Yeltsin was still playing games. He kept Bush waiting for nearly 15 minutes. Now, you know, you don't do that to the President of the United States to have an appointment for, you know, whatever it was, 1.15 and, and show up at 1.30. Uh, and this was in his own office, that is Yeltsin's office. So this didn't make him exactly a favorite. Uh, but, you know, after the coup, uh, 
in the attempted coup, it became very clear that the republics were going to go. And it looked as if, you know, we couldn't be sure for a while that Russia was going to sit still for this, but then it turned out in order to get rid of Gorbachev, Yeltsin, of course, led Russia out of the Union as well. Um, something who people forget when they talk about Russia as being inherently imperialistic. Actually, <laughs> Russia was the key republic that brought down the Soviet Union. Uh, but in any event, uh, at that point, it was clear we needed a relationship with Yeltsin, as I said. Uh, Bush was able to bond with him very quickly, uh, but he needed us and we, at that point, needed, needed him. I mean, uh, the big issue, of course, aside from uh, continuing to reduce nuclear weapons, was to secure the ones that were there. And, of course, when the Soviet Union broke up, four republics had them. And uh, that took some negotiation, and without our influence and a treaty that we signed, Ukraine might not have given them up. There was a lot of resistance in the Ukrainian parliament. So um, I think that um, there was, um, uh, there was a, a bonding with Yeltsin and Bush. After that, you know, I must say, uh, from the Russian standpoint, Clinton's relationship with Yeltsin you know, Yeltsin drank more than he should, and I think most Russians looked at it as if uh, Clinton would take advantage of him. It was like rolling a drunk. Every time, you know, they would meet, uh, Clinton would get his way. Uh, and he could, but he used it for good things, to get Russian troops out of the Baltic states and other things. Uh, we also gave our support to get Ukraine to send the nuclear weapons to Russia to concentrate them in one country. So it was a mutually... Uh, it was a mutually you know, advantageous relationship for a while, and yet when it came later to things like NATO expansion, which, you know, Yeltsin really felt was, although at one point he had said it's okay, he was the sort that would spout off these things, in fact, he considered it uh, very much an insult and uh, felt this very deeply. On the other hand, he didn't want a public spat with Clinton. And so, as I'd say, it was sort of, from the Russian standpoint, it was like Clinton was able to roll the drunk every time and end up with his wallet. Uh. Um, that, on that note, uh, <laughs> <laughs> before I, I let you all go and uh, thank Ambassador Matlock, I, I just want to remind you that parts three and four will be on the 10th and 11th of February. Uh, and we'll continue this uh, fascinating inside view um, of uh, debunking of the myths surrounding the end of the, the Cold War and the, and the breakup of the Soviet Union. So thank you very much.